diffuse lung disease. This is the first presentation prepared by Prof. Sharaf and revised by Prof. Yusreya Sabri. Starting with the indication for high resolution CT scan, you all know to evaluate the normal, to dis discuss and report about the pattern and distribution as well as activity of lesions, its response to therapy, and guidance for biopsy and to detect and evaluate bronchiectasis especially. Now two high resolution CT categories were identified. Two main high resolution CT categories were identified. Mosaic attenuation pattern, which is an indirect sign of constrictive obliterative bronchiolitis. Here lesions are mainly interstitial. But other signs exist. For example, reticulation, which may affect coarse peribronchial vessels, or could be interlobular, like septal lines, or thin intralobular, involving the uh, uh, in between the walls of the alveoli. It may produce nodular opacities or small translucencies, sometimes with traction bronchiectasis. Finally, all of this will end in honeycombing. This is the mosaic pattern. Tree and bud pattern is a direct sign of exudative bronchiolitis and the lesion here is mainly a small airspace disease. So the lesion, the first lesion, which is obliterative bronchi bronchiolitis, constrictive obliterative bronchiolitis, is mainly interstitial, while the oxidative bronchiolitis producing exudation, in the lesion is mainly small airspace disease, filling the alveoli. The first one is in between the alveoli. The second one is filling the alveoli. This is the main differences about these two categories. Diffuse lung disease is a general word. It includes both lesions or diseases involving the alveoli, inside the alveoli, or in between the alveoli, as we said. And if it is in between, it is called interstitial lung disease. And if it is inside, it is called small airspace disease. But there is interesting overlap. There is nothing called this disease. It's only small airspace disease, or this one is interstitial only. But usually it's mainly interspace. Uh, small air space, mainly interstitial and mostly are mixed. To get and identify the main lesion, try to go to the area least involved. This will show better the salient feature of the disease, whether it is mainly alveolar or mainly interstitial. Airspace disease or alveolar disease usually try to respect anatomy, whether a lobe or a segment. Airspace disease usually presents either diffuse butterfly or bat swing appearance, sometimes reverse bat swing, as in pulmonary edema. First one is pulmonary edema of the cardiogenic. That swing is pulmonary edema of the renal origin or renal cause. And airspace disease is usually presenting multiple small, ill defined, marginal, nodular changes rapidly coalesce together and blend together to form larger alveolar nodules. And this is called the patches. And these are the patches, usually with ill-defined margins. 
the reason the reason for this ill definition of margin is so simple that alveoli are connected to each other by pores of Lebercoon pores of Lebercoon so there is nothing called that exudation for example will be confined to one alveolus definitely it will go and extend into the second neighborhood alveolus alveolar uh, uh, through the alveolar wall through the pores of Lebercoon and thus the definition of these uh, lesions such as nodules or, or patches is definitely should be ill-definished, ill-defined ill-defined ill because of the extensions into the surrounding the third thing is the air bronchogram that it does not fill central bronchi and the bronchioles usually to the third, fourth, sixth segments but this alveolar disease mind you is not an acute form only it may be acute may be chronic may be representing pulmonary edema may be chronic representing infection and we have a lot of causes for the airspace disease or the alveolar disease Acute small airspace disease. If you remove this whole title, you just put acute lung conditions or acute consolidations. Of course, acute consolidation could be due to replacement of the alveolar air by blood, pus, transudate, exudate proteins, lipids, or cells. And cells is usually denoting, is usually denote malignancy. Now, replacement of alveolar air by blood, pus, transudations, uh, cells, proteins, lipids, to produce or to result in acute small airspace disease is the basic information in the term consolidation so this is consolidation blood can occur in there is pulmonary hemorrhage pus could be due to pneumonias in immune suppressed and immune deficiency syndromes. Transudations could be edemas like cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic. And it, it, it is usually a result of congestive heart failure. Cells as in alveolar cell carcinoma or lymphoma, protein like alveolar proteinosis or proteinosis and lipid like lipid pneumonia all these will result in diffuse pattern but it's mainly airspace disease now acute small airspace disease which you can remove the whole title and put for example acute pulmonary edema can appear early as a smooth thickening of the interlobular septa, perivascular interstitium, pleural fissure, bigger, thicker interlobular uh, uh, extensions of pleura, and around the vessels, so the vessels becomes apparently distended. But don't forget that. Alveoli near to each other are formed of thin one layer and beside the other one is thin one layer but within these two layers capillaries are there interstitium is still there so we have what we call intralobular so interlobular 
lobule is a group of alveoli. So it is interlobular septa or the careless B line and intralobular extensions or involvement. So smooth thickening of interlobular, intralobular and the very very bronchovascular interstitium plus thickening of the pleural fissure all are early in acute pulmonary edema. Late we will see the ground glass opacification which is sparing the APCs, the costophrenic angles and the periphery of the lung and more delayed is the presence or the occurrence of pleural effusion usually clears all what we described. Usually the smooth septal lines or the interlobular lines are seen at the basal pars peripherally. If you see it, please consider embedding or incipient occurrence of pulmonary edema. But still we have chronic small air space disease. And here we'll go again to our famous classification. It's, if it is granulomatous, could be infective or non-infective. And infective is TB and fungus. Non-infective is sarcoid and Wegener. And if it is non-granulomatous, could be infective again, like bronchopneumonia and septic emboli non-infective like malignancy as an alveolar cell carcinoma lymphoma but you should include here some of the mainly interstitial diseases like this quimative interstitial pneumonia azinophenic pneumonia lipoid pneumonia alveolar proteinosis uh, and alveolar proteinosis all of these are something away from the concept of consolidation, but they result in patchy opacities of consolidation. And that's why we started our presentation saying that there is no clear-cut limits between aerospace disease and interstitial disease. Some is mainly small aerospace disease, and some is, is mainly interstitial. So chronic small airspace disease means chronic consolidative lesions could be any of this group. And please be concise to this because you can you will use this in many other lesions and many other differential. The lung interstitium, this drawing show well where very bronchovascular interstitium where it is arborizing into and terminating within the lung into centrilobular at the center of lobules, centrilobular, interlobular in between the lung lobules and these are the careless lines intralobular that means it is inside the affected lobule and and finally the subpleural interstitium so the distribution of the interstitium is as follows very bronchovascular this will cause coarse reticulation and we have more thin reticulations which can occur as centrilobular interlobular, intralobular, and there is a subpleural interstitium. A secondary pulmonary lobule is formed of a lot of alveoli. Lesions within the alveoli is, a co is called the airspace disease. Now here, a secondary lobule, secondary lobule 
is supplied by centrilobular and related to a centrilobular region, it is supplied by something going into the center and it is separated from the nearby secondary lobule by interlobular septum. So we have two, two lymphatic systems, central network running along the very the bronchovascular bundles and the peripheral network located within the interlobular septa and along the pleural lining. The yellow one is along the, the, the yellow one delineating the lobules uh, is the lymphatics delineating the pleura and those around vessels are along the bronchovascular bundles. You understand this? Now going to the the right side image, we have random distribution of lesions. Sometimes you have, and the, the word central liver, as you see, is means around airways around the bronchi, the well seen bronchi, this is the centrilobular, while perilymphatic, perilymphatic is along the, the lymphatics we just described, along the pleural surfaces, whether interlobular or subpleural, or around vessels. We have two systems of lymphatics. So perilymphatic could be due to could be along pleura and could be along vessels. And we have the random distribution because sometimes lymphatics are going inside like that one. This is a lymphatic going inside a small secondary lobule, giving this appearance. The random distribution. Centrilobular, centrilobular is usually resulting in oxidative bronchiolitis, while as in pneumonias, and results in obstructive bronchiolitis, not restrictive. The, word, the, the proper word is obstructive bronchiolitis as in emphysema. So involvement of the centri centrilobular airways if it is oxidative, it is pneumonia. If it is something obstruction, obstructing, it will be emphysema. So simple. If you go to a line of any of these larger airways and you obstruct it, a ball, a ball valve mechanism occur and emphysema can start. If you bore fluid or pus inside, this will cause the oxidative type and that means pneumonia. And this is another description to the what fibrosis and what reticulations may be. This will be the septal interlobular. This will be the centrilobular inside the or, or enter intralobular, centrilobular or intralobular. This around the big vessels, very bronchovascular, and this again intralobular, like that, that one, but more condensed. And here are fissure, fissure, thickening of the fissure, and this is the along the distribution of the sub plural uh, 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 subplural interstitium as we said and the result all in all in honeycombing if there is some traction bronchiectasis will appear dilated bronchus in relation to a vessel it is called traction bronchiectasis and this is the called signet ring appearance. And this is the normal, it should be both the same, but not do not like appearance like this. 
this donut appearance is due to very bronchovascular interstitial thickening. I think enough for this. Diffuse lung diseases. We've, we have finished now the causes of air spirit diseases and the appearances. And we went into the interstitial, descri describing the different components of the, diff of the interstitial and how lymphatics are reaching into each part of the lung. Of course, this is, this, to know this will help us to, to know what will occur in interstitial lung disease. And the word interstitial lung disease, mainly the lesion is involving in, in between the alveoli. Groups of alveoli are called secondary lobules. So it is in between also the secondary lobules. More aggregations are forming segments, so the intersegmental course articulation. More uh, gathering together will cause uh, uh, lobes, so again we have interlobar fissure thickening and so on. So we are dealing now with the interstitial diseases and the definition or the nomenclature of interstitial lung disease it's essentially a diffuse disease. If you get the I and L and D it will be ILDs, interstitial lung disease. But a better name now is usually used is the DPLD and this to include more wider varieties than those involving the intercession only because as we said uh, the, the problem is we have it's not only reticular, not only nodular, it can produce decreased radiolucency as ground glass and the consolidation or it may produce pattern, pattern of increased lucencies like cystic bronchiectasis or normal lung in between bad uh, areas of the lung. And on the whole, although these are not considered interstitial diseases, yet the presence of cysts, visible cysts with walls, cavities with walls or emphysema without wall, all are to be described here because they are involving the lungs diffusely in most cases. Again, we will put the abbreviations ILDs or DBLD the diffuse parenchymal lung disease and we'll start to discuss the pattern. We started here as reticular, nodular and miliary and changes of radiolucency whether decreased or increased. Remember this classification because we we'll use it more than once. Here is the reticular pattern, and we just described the reticular pattern. They are due to the following, either coarse interstitial thickening around the vessels, and this is called peribronchovascular thickening, or due to in between secondary lobules, interlobular, means septal lines or curly B lines or maybe intralobular within the secondary lobule all of these can occur coarse reticulation as in, in between segments septal, septal thickening and Pleural thickening, uh, sorry, interstitial thickening can be either smooth 
and this is usually confined to acute interstitial pulmonary edema or it may be nodular this interstitial thickening could be nodular and here is the infiltrations of many of the diseases that we call there is infiltrate infiltrate means that the interstitium in between the alveoli is full of small irregular septal thickening you not uniform and this is present in all chronic reticular patterns the end result would be honeycombing so if we see reticular pattern in chronic lung disease you might be faced with one of three either interstitial lung disease of unknown etiology the group of interstitial pulmonary fibrosis or usual interstitial uh, pneumonia or the boob which is bronchiolitis of the trans group or the group of the interstitial pneumonias so we have group of unknown etiology forming one of these ILDs or, or DBLD one of the interstitial lung diseases or the parenchymal diffuse parenchymal lung diseases is called the interstitial pneumonias and the interstitial pneumonias example is the interstitial pulmonary fibrosis which is also called the usual interstitial pneumonia and boob which is called which is the abbreviation of bronchiolitis organizing obliterans pneumonia The second is the interstitial lung disease of known etiology. This group has an unknown etiology, but this one has known etiology. Hypersensitivity reaction, extrinsic alveolitis, pneumoconiosis is inhalation, asbestosis is inhalation. Some of the drugs they, like mesotrexates and amiodarone, amiodarone is and the bleomycins are also involved if you if the patient is using such drugs for long this will cause lung changes lymphangitis and the non-infective granulomas like sarcoid also should be included in those with known etiology and then we have the group of interstitial lung disease in connective tissue diseases for example rheumatoid systemic sclerosis amyloidosis and this connective tissue disease we also include collagen vascular disease and collagen vascular disease are the, almost the same now if you collect all together we have those of chronic and those of acute. Acute, we know the best example is pulmonary edema. But don't forget that you have many acute conditions that can result in diffuse interstitial lung disease. And here you know the cause. For example, viral infection, mycoplasma infection, pneumocystis carinae. These three are acute 
and they are post infection. We have interstitial disease which is post infection and the resolution usually occur. The group here is acute, all is acute and remember these three PCP, viral and mycoplasma, pneumocystis carinae, pneumonia, viral pneumonias and mycoplasma pneumonias in addition to acute pulmonary edema. But there are, we have chronic lung disease in which a reticular pattern can be seen. Either we know it, for example, those with hypersensitivity reactions, those with pneumoconiosis, and the history is usually evident. Those on drugs, lymphangitis if there is primary, and non-infective granulomas as the sarcoid, all these groups are easily to be recognized. But you have another group that of unknown etiology, and these are called the interstitial pneumonias. Interstitial pneumonias. And here, the best example is interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. And this is also called usual interstitial pneumonia. And bronchiolitis obliterans, organizing obliterans pneumonia. These are unknown, of unknown etiology. Etiology. The third group is interstitial lung disease showing reticulations in case of connective tissue disease or collagen vascular disease. The best examples are three the rheumatoid, the systemic sclerosis, and the amyloidosis. Going to the another category, which is the nodular opacities and miliary opacities. And don't forget that we have two sites, centrilobular, around large vessels, and very lymphatic, which extends into the periphery may be intralobular. There are some mistakes here, so don't worry. Miliary shadowing. When to say that this miliary shadowing and this is not an alveolar nodule, alveolar nodulation or patchy nodules. Miliary shadows are usually well of well-defined margins. Well-defined margins. They are enclosed within the interstitium surrounded by air so they are well defined and there are no pores of liver cone to allow them to go to the other other neighborhood alveolus the alveoli are filled with air and the lesions are in between that's why miliary shadows are usually well defined we have two groups of miliary affection, either centrilobular, that means around known, well seen bronchovascular markings, and this is the airways, you know the airways, and this could be pneumonia if it is of the exudative bronchiolitis type, and could be emphysema if it is of the obstructive obstructive or restrictive type of bronchiolitis but it may be very lymphatic reaching to the periphery along interlobular interlobular intralobular lobular like the sarcoid and lymphangitis carcinomatosa and edema meaningly you can see septal lines you can see coarse reticulum at the periphery and this is called the peri lymphatic so again, so quickly we can go to our famous, here is centrilobular, and here are, here are perilymphatic, 
according to this rule because lymphatic are in between lobules and subpleural and also with the, with the small vessels. So we have two types of lymphatics, perilymphatic along the interlobular, and this is interlobular, along intralobular, like this one, and along interlobar, like this one, the big one, or like this one, all of these are very lymphatic, and usually the reticulation behaves, nodulation behaves like reticulation, that means they are well defined, but small and round. The central lobular are at the center, uh, around the bronchial, uh, around, around the airways, around the, there is no airway here. You can hardly see an airway here. This is segment, segment 24, starting from here. So you are allowed to see up to six, segment 6. I, and if you see a bronchus like that, and you have nodule, big nodules around, this is called centrilobular nodules. So nodular, we have centrilobular, that means around airways, and very lymphatic that reach into the periphery. An example for center around the airways or the central part is pneumonia and the presence of emphysema. If you consider emphysema one of the interstitial diseases, which is not considered by, by some. And the second item is the, the presence of miliary, very lymphatic shadowing, like in sarcoid, along fissures, along interlobar, interlobular, and intralobular. Uh, lymphatics. Of course, miliary it is a rule that miliary shadowing is commonly due to infection or metastasis. The most common cause for miliary shadowing is TB. The most common cause of miliary shadowing is the snowstorm of thyroid carcinoma and testes. But if you want to classify which is usually our aim because this is something related to the human being. He want, always wants to classify things. If we class, can classify this, we have granulometers and non-granulometers. And in the granulometers, again, we can put the infective. Infective granulometers means TB. But don't forget the fungus. Non-infective granuloma means sarcoid but don't forget isonophilic granuloma. The second group are the non-granulomatous. They are not granuloma and infective. Of course, we can put septic emboli in the bronchopneumonia. Non-infective as in malignancy in meds, the snowstorm of the thyroid carcinoma and miscellaneous as in UIB and pneumoconiosis. Please stick this classification. Now we finished reticulations, we finished miliary, we are going to the consolidation in the ground the glass opacities, which is usually a mixture of alveolar and interstitial. Here we go to the dilemma. Both are there. And if you remember the classification of interstitial lung disease as acute and chronic, and in the acute, we do not forget the uh, viral, the BCP, the mycoplasma, the pulmonary edema, and in the chronic, we don't forget three groups, those of known and those of unknown and those related to connective tissue. This is the groups we are dealing with. So if you put, we mention about boob before, we mention about dip before, we mention about hypersensitivity, we mention about drug, collagen vascular diseases, 
Consider diffuse lung diseases that result in chronic consolidation like alveolar carcinoma, lymphoma, alveolar proteinosis. So chronic lung diseases can be so uh, can present as consolidations in alveolar carcinoma. It's something which will not resolve. Lymphoma will not resolve. Alveolar proteinosis. It is a rare because intra-alveolar accumulation of surfactant like lipoproteinaceous material and it cannot it will not resolve. Lipoid pneumonia it's a rare lipids in the alveoli exogenous by inhalation or endogenous associated associated with bronchial obstruction and they do not resolve smoothly. So this should be this table this classification should be taken in consideration with with this consolidation can be seen in boob and UIP in deep can consolidation could be seen in any of this consolidation could be seen in connective tissue diseases and consolidation could be seen in all those of the acute processes so it's nothing none something which is not specific but it should be mentioned that it is there always there we we'll finish the miliary we have finished the miliary and now we are doing the consolidation and the ground the glass appearance which is usually a mixture try to put the same classification uh, but the famous things are there here are written here whether any of this but don't forget that consolidation in alveolar cell carcinoma lymphoma alveolar proteinosis and the lipid pneumonia, lipoid pneumonia are not resolving. These are diseases that result in chronic consolidation. What's ground the glass and the tree in bud? We are usually uh, uh, hearing such things. Tree in bud that in the periphery you find something like this, like a tree, small tree. while central lobular is a ground glass which will fill all this space. The ground glass and tree in buds indicates the presence of endobronchial spread of infection or airway disease or mucus retention, something like this are the most common, but it is not indicative of interstitial disease in itself. It may be due to mucus retention, due to restrictive or obliterative changes of fibrosis. Yes. It could be due to endobronchial spread of infection, due to decreased viability of the affected lung in interstitial disease. Yes. But ground glass appearance is due to infection, due to mucus retention due to airway disease and this is the origin of again of the say that ground glass appearance is consolidation and the consolidation is maybe blood pus cells or lipoid material or protein so don't forget that that ground glass <coughs> again could be acute as in the three things the viral the, uh, PCP and mycoplasma and could be chronic as interstitial disease of unknown etiology the interstitial pneumonitis and the interstitial group of diseases of known etiology like drug or hypersensitivity and the interstitial diseases of uh, 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 collagen vascular origin. 
all will result in any of these either secondary infection or mucus retention due to impairment of drainage or bronchial traction, bronchiectasis, and cystic fibrosis in the airways. So these are the key points to form the ground glass. Could be simple infection, but it could be cystic bronchitis complicating interstitial disease, could be mucosal mucus retention complicating interstitial disease. Either mechanical or allergic. Now we have a group of diseases. Still we have we are discussing the interstitial lung disease and one of the patterns we can see that there is increased radiolucency of the lung which could express the presence of a cavity or a cyst or emphysema. Of course these three are not interstitial disease by themselves but they can occur and the assumption that they are of increased radiolucency should should be think you should thought about think about in case for example emphysema if you have emphysematous area and there is something obliterating fibrosis peripronchial fibrosis or traction bronchiectasis that is small cavity and so on so uh, increased radiolucency can occur in the course of interstitial lung diseases, but it is not part of it. And that's why we put the term the diffuse parenchymal lung disease to include to include interstitial lung diseases and their associations. Interstitial lung disease with pattern of increased uh, uh, radiolucency, like the, as we said, small cavity or small cyst, usually these two have walls, but in emphysema you cannot see a wall. And these are associations of this group. You know PCP, pneumocystis carinae pneumonia, and you know cystocytosis, and you know now UIP, which is usual interstitial pneumonia, and you know LIP, which is uh, uh, lymphomatous or lymphad lymphadenoid, and then we have the lymph, uh, the lamb, which is the so lamb is the lymphangiomyomatosis lymphangiomyomatosis this group of disease tends result in small cysts of well of well defined outline Cavities of well defined outline, as traction bronchiectasis, and can result in centrilobular emphysema. So, this result in increased lucency of the lung. So, increased lucency of the lung is an association of this group of disease. Differential diagnosis of cavitary nodule. This should be taken in consideration if there is a cavity and the cavity is a, there is a nodule and the nodule is cavitating. So remember the word cavity and cavity means C A V I T Y, C for cancer, A for autoimmune like Wegener, V for vascular like embolic and embolic septic emboli. I for infection like lung abscess, TB, fungus, T for trauma, lung laceration, and Y for young cystic adenoid sequestration and bronchogenic cyst. 
Huai means young, and in the young you can find this sequestration bronchogenic cysts and adenoid malformation. Thank you.